เห็นรูปครับรูปโอเคนั่นก็ดีนั่ง For the openness of local bodies regulations 2014, this meeting is being live streamed and may otherwise be recorded, filmed, or communicated on other medium platforms. The recording of this meeting will be made available on the council's YouTube channel shortly after the meeting. Both councillors and officers in attendance are reminded to make full use and to speak clearly into the microphones at all times. A reminder that mobile phones should be turned off or put on silent mode. Those present at the meeting should refrain from taking telephone calls. Thank you. Apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Adams and Councillor Dowling. Thank you. And in dream. Thank you. Can I give um, apologies uh, for Councillor Gamble? Mm -hmm. Apologies have been received from Councillor Gamble as well. Yeah, appointments of substitutes. Should have been received there. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Charlesworth. Yeah, um, I have an allotment which I may refer to later, and I also used to run a business that required a licence from this department, so I'll declare that now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, Mayor signed. Thank you. Action list arising from Chair's briefing. Mr. Gill, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <coughs> during the. Sorry, Chair's waving. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, during the Chair's briefing, uh, the Chair asked for some uh, information uh, in, with regard to updating a couple of matters. The first one was in respect of e-scooters and what the current legal position is. And the current legal position is, as set out on the action list, it's illegal to use a privately owned e-scooter on the public highway, roads, pavements, or cycle paths. However, it is legal to ride a rental e-scooter where a trial rental scheme exists, subject to the local rules. And as of February uh, 2022, there are 32 regions operating rental schemes across many of the urban areas of the UK. There is not a rental scheme within Odeon Wilson Borough Council, so any use of e-scooters is illegal. Enforcement against e-scooters is a matter for the police because they're considered to be motorised vehicles and that people are required to have a driving licence, insurance, um, and also if they've been drinking, they can be convicted of driving a motor vehicle whilst under the influence. So that's the position as far as e-scooters. Uh, and in respect of mobility scooters, um, I know there's some concern about mobility scooters being used on the highway or on the pavement. The highway code advises pavements are safer than roads for the users of power vehicles. However, users of mobility scooters on the pavement should give pedestrians priority, show consideration for other pavement users, uh, particularly those who have a visual uh, or hearing impairment, and they must not travel faster than four miles per hour on pavements or in pedestrian areas. Anybody have any questions on that, Chair? Yes, Councillor Lloyd, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I thank you very much for putting this um, item onto the agenda um, this evening because I have got some serious concerns about things that are happening um, in the borough at the moment, and I can't believe that they are not happening um, <coughs> nationwide. We've got here, I, I actually have written to the Transport Minister myself, Grant Schnapps. Um, I haven't had any reply from him. Having said that, under the circumstances, I would find it reasonable to understand why he hasn't replied. But we have, I have had three incidents now in the last six months where residents have made contact with me because they have on two occasions been knocked over by <laughs> mobility scooters, one of which required hospital treatment and stitches to the face, and the other one where they were not pushed out of the way, but um, had to jump out of the way by an e-scooter on pavement. 
And only last week, I actually witnessed an easement <laughs> going down the busy Aylston Lane. You would not believe it, with a small baby strapped to the front of his chest. And he's there on an e-scooter going down the middle of the Aylston Lane, which is not a minor road. Um, so we've got a number of incidents now arising in the borough. And I've no doubt other councillors have had to come across incidences. On each occasion, I have advised them to go to the police <clears throat> and record it and get a crime number so that the police can build up evidence so that eventually things can be done. But I think as a council, I would like to think that we could be more responsible and, and take a little bit more action. And probably, um, first of all, I'd like to see the, the rules and regulations advertised on our website and encouraging residents, if they are injured, <laughs> go to the police and get a crime number. And secondly, if as a council, we could actually write expressing our concerns to the transport minister or the transport department because <laughs> under the new legislation i don't think under the new guidelines i don't think they go far enough to protect pedestrians on the footpath if you look at this advert which goes into the mercury and into the national papers because i took this out of the national paper it is now advertising cabin cars. No vehicle tax needed, no car insurance needed, no driving license needed. So these things, I mean, I wouldn't drive one. Hopefully I never have to because they, they remind me of the postman pack <laughs> buses. But these are going round on our pavements now. And we've just heard um, Mr Gill say that they must not be driven at more than four miles an hour. Who's monitoring it? And if you get hit by one of those, even at four miles an hour, they can do some damage to you. So my biggest concern is the damage that they're doing to pedestrians and secondly, that there is no comeback. Each of the three incidents I came across, Chair, the mobility scooters, the mobility things did not stop. So they were hit. There's no registration. There's no way of finding out. There's no redress. And even if they do stop, you've got to take civil action against them to get redress. And I don't think that that is what the government, who say they are prioritising pedestrians, I don't think that's actually working. And I don't think it will work. So with your permission, Chair, and whether this group would like to follow through, I'd like to see those two courses of action taking place, that it is put onto our website, quite clearly the rules and regulations and advising people to go to the police and get in a crime number. And secondly, if we as a council, a licensing authority, could write to the transport secretary expressing our concerns that these rules and regulations do not protect pedestrians sufficiently on the footpaths. Um, that's entirely up to everybody else now whether or not they accept that. Thank you, Chair. Mr Gill, do you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. Certainly there's no issue whatsoever in putting something on the uh, website and that can be arranged fairly quickly. Um, with regard to the e-scooters themselves, the trials don't end until the end of March, so there's a few weeks on that and then the government will be going out to consultation again. Uh, we can certainly write to the Department of Transport if that was if that is what members wish to ask them to uh, um, consider looking at mobility scooters. Oh. Thank you. Could we have a show of hands to give Mr Gill some guidance? 
Okay, Nana. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. That's another job for me then. Um, moving on on there. Hold on, we've still Sorry. got more questions. Uh, Councillor Carter, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I share similar concerns to Councillor Dell, but my question is perhaps the other way around. Um, having done some research on mobility scooters for my mother in law, I also discovered the joys of cabin vehicles, but also um, mobility scooters which are designed to go at eight miles per hour. And as, as Councillor Lloyd Dell read out, are designed to be used on the road. These are quite big beasts. <laughs> so my question is the other way around. What is the, the guidance or what are the rules around these rather bigger beasts and their use on the pavement? Because clearly if you've got a small mobility scooter, it can maneuver quite easily around on a pavement or paved area. When you're talking about these capital cars or these things which are like mini vehicles, they are somewhat more easy things to deal with. Um, so is there any guidance on those and any clarification or confirmation of um, the rules around their use? Thank you, Mr Gill, please. I think this might be the first actually, Chair. I actually don't know Councillor Carter, so I have to <laughs> um, for that. I, I, my concentration was on the mobility scooters on the road. Can I ask you, that, if you leave that with me, and yep. ah, my colleague here is Sorry, I was working researching while we were talking. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wells has just handed me um, his laptop and he's been doing some research. The cabin car is designated as a class three invalid carriage and can therefore be driven on the pavement and the road. So that's a frequently asked question. If members wanted to have a bit more detail as to what type of vehicles can be used on, on the uh, road, then could I ask that you uh, Leave it with me. I can do some research outside of the meeting and then circulate a, a written advice note, Chair, if that's uh, acceptable. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bolter. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting. Can't come more than four miles an hour. To the best of my mind, it's not got a speed on, it from the, on these vehicles. Um, it's hard to know how fast they're going. I would suggest it very much depends on the battery size. The battery torque will only give a certain amount of um, speed at any one time. But again, as I've said, if you could leave it with me, members, and I'll, I will do a briefing note that I can circulate to you um, outside of the meeting before the next meeting. Depends if there's a headwind or a tail. Thank you, Mr. Cochran. <laughs> Mr. Gill, you want to move on? I will, but unfortunately, I've lost my hand there with me. Yeah, so the, the next uh, point that the chair raised was with regard to an update on the arrangements in place of Sidlake street parties to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Um, the street parties are being organised by the County Council. There is a county-wide approach to um, requests for um, road closures. Uh, there will be no charge for the road closures for the Platinum um, Jubilee. Um, and on the agenda form, you see that it sets out uh, the the links to uh, the um, documents. Uh, every organiser has to complete uh, an event form, and the event form comes through to us. We then send it on to county. Uh, there is a, a spreadsheet with numerous entries on it, which indicate that where the party is going to be held right across the county. Uh, but they do need to submit the registration form before the 15th of April. Uh, if they're going to have a county road closure, uh, there is a little bit of flexibility in that this authority has its own powers under the Town Police Clauses Act of 1847, Section 21, which enables us to um, do, do road closures. So if people are too late, then we would consider actually exercising our own powers, certainly in the residential areas, uh, you know, small streets and closes where people just want to a barrier so that the neighbours can have a, a party in the street. I would say any questions if members have got any. No, there are no questions. We'll move on. Item seven, petition for deputation. I'm not being received, Chair. Thank you. Item eight, licensing team plan. Presumably, Mr. Mr. Wells. Mr. Wells, please. 
Yeah. Yeah, everyone. Um, the service, as I'm sure you appreciate, regulates and licenses people, vehicles, and premises. There's a large variety of volume of work. Some of it is administrative, but there's also a considerable amount of fair regulation, both on a proactive and reactive basis. The pandemic has impacted on many of our businesses and also the way the team works. As one member of the team was seconded to work with me on a COVID response, and the former manager left in December this year. I believe, therefore, it's appropriate and timely for this report before you. So I can set out a clear focus for the team, one which drives performance moving forward. In the report, in table one, I set out the priorities and how we'll measure success going forward. Key messages, I believe, are providing clarity to our approach to ensure effective protection, supporting our businesses and improving outcomes and compliance without placing unnecessary regulatory burden on those businesses. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, having personally dealt with um, the department in the running of a business here, uh, I, I have some understanding of the issues that face you. Uh, I've got a number of questions. First one is, do we as an authority know of all the premises in the borough that require a license? Do we have that database? Okay. I think with the pandemic, we've probably got more information now than we've ever had before because businesses were applying for grants, businesses were opening when they shouldn't have been and people were reporting it and so forth. So I'm more confident. The answer is no. We don't know every single business in the district because some pop up, some go, but we are better informed than we've ever been before. Thank you. And of those businesses that we do know about, how many are up to date with their licenses? That is some of the work that I'm setting out as one of the priorities moving forward, because clearly my concern is the pandemic meant we took resource away from that team to help with that response. Unfortunately, that was the way it was. As you know, a lot of the businesses shut, some adapted to the way they work, some changed, some have reopened. So I think moving forward, I'm really keen that actually we do do that. We make sure they're paying, paying the right fees and that actually we do enforce against those and make sure they're fulfilled conditions because it's only fair for any other business that we're doing it for everyone. I, I think you're quite right. Um, businesses should be paying what they owe uh, and they should all be singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, what, what I do have a concern with is, 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 is the admin side here. Um, I, one case in particular, I won't mention names, but they were sent a bill for £540, which they clearly didn't owe because of poor record keeping here. And to, it, it, it was a license, an alcohol license, um, and it's incumbent upon the license holder to come forward each year and do that piece of work, sure. which I find odd because I mean the, the license was seventy pounds now established, and yet I've got an allotment for twenty something pound, and I'm sent an invoice. Yet all these more expensive licenses and sundries and whatever are not. It's incumbent upon. I just find it odd that tiny bits you get a piece of paper for, and the other items you don't. Councillor uh, Charles, Mr Gill has an explanation, I feel. One second, please, Mr Gill. And, and what really concerned me was that this <coughs> licence holder had to provide proof of payment that he'd made to the council because we hadn't got proof of payment that he had done that. That I find disturbing. I don't know whether it's a one-off. I hope it is. But the fact that it happened, you know, it doesn't reflect well on this council that people have got to dig back through years of bank accounts to prove they've actually paid this council something. I think our financial department 
not just your department, but the financial, it needs to work together better because there was clearly some disparity between licensing and finance saying, well, no, he's not paid, but you're saying he was paid. And that's not acceptable. Not to members of the public, it's not. So I think you've got a bit of work to do, but I'll listen to Mr. Gill's explanation. Thank you, Councillor Jolworth. Um, the starting point is that the council is not under any duty to issue an invoice for any annual license fee. That is the duty of the license holder to make sure that they do. There has been an issue in the past in that because invoices have not been issued, then um, payments are received into the finance system and it's not always clear who those payments are from and what they are for. And there's a tendency, or has been a tendency in the past, to just insert the what we call the GL code, the particular income code. Um, so that income code, which is nine numbers, might have 40, 50, 60,000 transactions against it. So it then becomes a, a massive job to try and identify um, who's paid and who hasn't paid. What we have got is we uh, have a new system which we're, we're currently implementing, which is called Unicorn <coughs> and it's called Enterprise. What that will do is it will alert the officers to when the payment is due. So as we go through marrying up all these payments, we insert the date that it was paid and the system will automatically tell us that the, in, the payment is due uh, and it will uh, allow us to write to them. What we're also going to do, we have in finance um, a what they call periodic uh, invoice um, system where invoices that only come around once a year are on a list and that list is, is run on a regular basis and it automatically produces an invoice. Because I want to be certain that when the payment request goes out, there is an individual barcode for that particular premise so that payment is automatically allocated to that account so that we don't have this problem going forward. And so it, it's a historical issue. Um, as you go, it was before my time, but obviously we're, we're well aware of it. And Mr. Wells and I, working with the licensing team, are keen to make sure that going forward, as soon as we know that somebody's paid their license this year, we enter that date so that the system will automatically tell us next year that it's due. I hope that clarifies the position. It does. Thank you, Mr. Gill. I mean, all I want as a member is an accurate, up to date, and fair system in place for residents and businesses. Thank you. Councillor Faulkner. <laughs> Somewhere I've lost it. Somewhere in here I've learned that we licensed 10 hairdressing salons in, in, in the borough. My quick thought of that is that there are more than 10. And in addition to that, I know from looking on the internet that there are a lot of people operating, a lot, a lot of people operating from home doing whatever beauticians do or whatever hairdressers do, which are licensable activities. Are we able to license them? And what control do we have to make sure that people receiving the services have the same sort of protection as they would in the pen? Uh, and I'm not sure how many beauticians are. There. Are beauticians um, no. <laughs> um, covered? But basically, a lot of people seem to be operating at home. How do we find them? I think it's not only people operating at home. People rent out a chair in a salon, don't they? So it's individual hairdressers rather than the salon um, that I think yeah. you probably want an answer to. Yeah, the position is with hairdressers. Hair, the premises has to be licensed and the person has to be licensed, but they only ever have to be licensed once. It's not an annual fee. So if you've got somebody who was a hairdresser and started in, in 1980, and had a license, that is it as far as they are concerned. New people coming into those premises require a license. They are actually dealt with under the Leicestershire Act, so it's not the, the normal things. Um, there's currently a debate taking place in uh, government to extend <coughs> the licensing regime to include beauty therapists um, and microblading and all. All these things um, that, that 
I don't know about that, but I hear about them, but I don't need them, to be quite honest. So um, we're hoping that shortly, we did consider at one stage trying to introduce some bylaws um, to um, address these issues under the Local Miscellaneous Provisions Act, but we did receive advice, legal advice for, from a, a barrister that, that that would be stretching the legislation too far. So what we've got to do is wait for government to introduce the new scheme. Thank you. Councillor Lloyd. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, having read this report, I, I've always been under the impression, and I don't think it's wrong, that there is a very heavy caseload falling on the licensing department. And I have asked in the past that, are you sure that you have the capacity within your staff to cope with the workload that is going on. And I mean, I look again, and a lot of this, okay, is because we've had, we've, we've come through the pandemic, but even looking at the increased number of taxi and, taxi and private car hire requests that we've had, I am now concerned even more so that you have the capacity to meet all of the requirements. So that's the first question. And secondly, I look at table one and you are looking at ensuring compliance with licensing requirements by delivering a program of inspection. And you're looking at a minimum of 10%. Now I know from past records especially where licensing of taxi and hackney carriages are concerned. We used to do inspections and, and pull them off the road and we had a considerable failure rate. Are you happy that 10% inspection <clears throat> is sufficient enough to catch on the irresponsible ones that we have I'm not talking about a good number of responsible ones that really think about their, but because we've had such an increase in requests, surely we have an increase in, they usually go together. Um, are you happy with that 10%? Because I'm not sure as I would be happy with it. I think, I think the answers probably are integrated. So capacity, is a challenge for us. Um, we're keeping that under review. We're looking at some temporary support to get records up to date, as Mr. Gill has mentioned, with the new system put in place. We're trying to get all those records put in and, and implemented and up to date. My view is by working smarter and, and with a clearer focus, it's achievable. So that's my initial view. I've recently, obviously, the call for meeting in December date, um, Mr. Gill has asked me to sort of look into environmental health and other things. So, capacity is a challenge, but I feel that with the right measures in place and the right priorities in place, we can achieve this and the right systems working. Coming to the 10%, 10% was put in really having regard for capacity in number one. Number two, if that 10% is telling us there's a real problem here, there's a lot of failures, a lot of problems, a lot of issues, we will have to up that, really. And we will have to look back to ensure the safety of, of the licensed activity, whatever it might be. The other thing we are doing is that when, for example, um, one of our food inspectors goes out to a licensed premises, we're getting them to check the licensed conditions and the display in the right formats as well. So we're trying to work a bit smarter across different areas. So that actually doing education work. So they're not going to visit the licensing officer and then one from an environment and health officer. So clearly by integrating it to one business, that will save time for the other. So the 10% coming back to that point is really, we need to be doing some more. And I'll be honest, we're not, we're not really doing that number. We need to be pushing that out, making it clear to you that's what we want to do. If that's telling us there is a problem, then we will have to increase that. Okay. So that's Bill, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can I, can I just make a comment on, on that? Um, um, Mr. Wells has made the point about working smarter. Um, and the system that I mentioned uh, to Councillor Charlesworth 
um, is a system that has built in workflows. So it actually manages the work. It tells us the next stages to do. So for instance, when you get a, um, a premises license application and this 28 day consultation period, when you enter that into the system, the system parks it over here for 28 days. So the officer doesn't have to do anything with it, doesn't have to worry about it. It's not sitting there on the desk. If during those 28 days, a representation comes in, then the system will bring it back from the 28 days to today. So it's input into the system and it comes back to the officer and it shows them the work that they have to do and the priorities that they've got to take. And adding on to the point that Mr. Wells made about uh, doing joint visits with the food safety officers, we are currently going, or shortly going to be rolling out some um, mobile devices. We've purchased a number of Surface Pro um, uh, devices, which are wirelessly connected. They will link into the VPN, so to the council's um, uh, network. So the officer, whether it be an environmental health officer, food safety officer, licensed officer, when they go and do their inspection, they will be able to input all of that information directly into the system whilst they're at the premises, rather than having to come back into the office with a load of paper notes and then have to put the notes in and then have to generate the letters and the emails. So it's all about smarter working and making it more efficient, and that should free up a considerable amount of capacity. And also, given that most of the applications that we are now getting are electronic in terms of taxis and um, premises licenses, etc., that also speeds up the, the, the work because there's no need to have to stop what you're doing to go to the scanner to, to scan it in and then send. It. So we're looking at all those things to make the systems move better. Um, but always, we will keep an eye on capacity, and if it becomes an issue, then we will have to put a business case forward um, to try and justify an increase in staff. But given the financial situation, everybody appreciates that we're in, you know, that, that may be a hard ask. And I come back on that, Chair, and I, I'd like to, to thank the officers, because I do recognise, and I think we all recognise, that they are under extreme pressure at the moment to, to not only do the work but to catch up on um work from you know, because we've been through the pandemic so i'd like to thank them for that but i think it's important that we have a report back at the next licensing meeting on how this is this is going because although we've got smarter working practices what we don't want to see is officers who probably have been put under a lot of pressure to do that and then not being able to cope and, and we lose officers which then puts more pressure on those that are left so if we could have a report back at the next meeting to make sure that this is going along the way they would like it to go and we as councillors <coughs> duty to see that it's going correctly thank you chair thank you there are no more questions so we move on to item nine mr gill is that Yes. Deal with this one there, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So this is a basically a very quarter three report for last year, which builds on what Mr. Wells has already presented in the licensing report and sets out the work that's being undertaken. So we um session one deals with the taxi licensing update uh and what we have been um, assisting with over the past uh, period is a review of the taxi of the external auditors um, after implementation of the uniform system. Um, and there's also some HMRC requirements coming in for drivers. I think we'll be aware from um, following the 4th of April, we won't be able to accept an application from a driver unless they have completed a tax check. So basically, HMRC want to ensure that they are registered for tax. Uh, and that also applies across the scrap metal as well. Uh, the new highway code became effective uh, from the 29th of January. That sets up the hierarchy. Um, and it, as a result of that, we have to change the competency test for persons who want to become a driver to make sure that they understand the new highway code. Um, the 
members will be aware that previously we had the Sam Says campaign, which was supported by this committee. That's now incorporated into the highway code in, in the form of the Dutch Reach. <coughs> um, and we are making sure that all of our vehicles have got stickers promoting that. Um, section three sets out the number of licenses that members of offices have dealt with um, over that period from, from March last year. Um, section four sets out the policies that are under review. So the scrap metal policy is under review because of the HMRC requirements. The street trading um, policies to be reviewed for 2023. <laughs> and the limited amount of special treatments that we can cover at the moment uh, is under review. And then the animal welfare. Animal welfare has changed quite considerably recently. Um, and as a consequence, uh, we've tax changed the, the or haven't changed the policy. What we can say now is that we do have trained staff within the building so that we can do our own animal welfare checks, whereas previously we had to um, borrow officers from other authorities at a cost. There's a section there on collective licensing, um, as requested by um, uh, members previously, and sets out what the position is, uh, well, the current position is. Um, I think, from my perspective, I think the officers have worked amazingly well. Uh, given the pandemic, the fact that it was delayed, um, you know, the income raised is over £500,000. Um, we, out of the number of properties that, that we thought we would have, which was down to 814, we've got 80 that haven't complied and 80 um, notices of intention have been issued against them, which basically means that if they don't do what they should do, um, and a final notice is due. There's a penalty of up to thirty thousand pounds per property. So, you know, that is the focus at the moment uh, on that. Um, as Mr. Wells said, uh, the regulatory services manager left uh, in December last year. Uh, Mr. Cawthorn, we're currently out to advert um, for a selective licensing team leader um, who will take over the team uh, if we're fortunate enough to a point uh, Mr Wells is, will be conducting the interview shortly uh, and part of the role of that post will be to do the necessary um, groundwork to determine whether or not there, there is any other area of the borough that, that the selective licensing um, process could move across to. What is interesting, at a national level, government are looking to introduce private sector housing standards for rented properties, i.e effectively a selective licensing scheme but from central government's end so from our perspective as a as an authority once again we were at the front you know we were leading on this um as a result of what we're doing in south wigston um mr Cawthorn left mr Cawthorn left because he he's gone to work for the city council that's the city council because left the city council saw our scheme saw that it was working um, and they decided to examine the feasibility of introducing their own scheme. So, you know, uh, as a small authority, um, who often get a bad press, we're quite often on the front foot um, and leading by example. Below that, we have the environmental health update, uh, and where we explain uh, what support we've been given to, we're giving to businesses throughout the COVID um, pandemic. There's then a short section on their quality. Um, I'm sure a member will ask a question about the AQM on Blaby Road. So I'm going to preempt that question before I get asked it. Um, we, the, the difficulty has been with getting the electricity supply in place, then with getting the uh, meter in place. And then when the machine was built, the connection was on the wrong side for the, the meter. So we are working um, with the supplier um, and we are pressing to get that sorted as soon as possible. And the big issue was during COVID, it, every time we tried to get it in, it was uh, um, delayed and cancelled. But um, Mr. Wells and his team are certainly on top of that uh, and pushing to get that moving as quickly as possible. Uh, and also, in terms of air quality monitoring, 
what we are trying to do now is where we have developments uh, or new developments, um, such as up Newton Lane and across the ground there, uh, we are seeking to get more air quality monitoring stations uh, as part of Section 106 contributions so that we can you know, have a, a good spread across the borough. Um, food safety update. Again, food safety um, has been an issue. Um, staff shortages, difficulty in conducting inspections, but we are following the FSA guidance. One of the big issues was the number of people who took up home baking during the pandemic and started uh, selling on Facebook and wherever. Uh, so the number of premises that, that were registered was astronomical. Uh, we did apply for and successfully obtain a grant from the Food Standards Agency. Um, so for just short of 1,800 pounds, but that allowed us to pre-order all of the new food businesses that have been established since the lockdown. Uh, and they're now being programmed into the, the routine inspections. But quite a lot of them that originally registered are now no longer doing it because the people that were doing it have now gone back to work. So, you know, it's a, it's a changing uh, feast. Um, and you'll see from April 2021, we received 150 new registrations. So that's, that's a lot. Um, it sets out the 7.6, how we classify a high risk um, business. Uh, and it sets out that what we have got. We are, we are happy that we are in front of the FSA's roadmap for dealing with um, food safety. So they, they set out a plan of how we should deal with it. And we're confident that uh, by the end of March, we will be uh, in front of that. Um, and that's because we've been able to utilize a couple of environmental health officers on an ad hoc basis from Harbour. Um, so they've been working their Saturdays and <laughs> evenings and whatever for us. Um, get sort of dog con contract update with extending the contract until um, March next year. There was a provision in the contract to do that uh, without any increase in charges. Um, in 2021, there were five dog seeds, Mr. Fraser takes them to the kennels. There hasn't been any FBNs issued for dog fouling, but 36 requests have been made for foot bath stenciling across the borough. We are aware that that contract has to be renegotiated um, next year, and we are also aware that the price, the you know, charges will undoubtedly increase. Um, but in the interim, what they're going to do is they're going to do um, try and facilitate a free micro chipping event during the summer uh, for the benefit of residents. So that's the update, uh, Chair. I have to take any questions. Thank you. Can I just ask this government scheme for selective licensing that you're yeah. saying they're coming up with, will that affect us in cost wise? You know, if the government are going to introduce something, they usually want the money for it. Um, so the fact that we've already got it in place in South Wigston, will it affect the, the money that we get in from it? it will, no, it won't, Chair, because the the way that the payments are made on the selective licensing scheme is in two parts. First, there's your application fee, and then secondly, there's your enforcement fee. Application fee has to be paid on application. <coughs> paid when your license has been issued. Um, it's unlikely that, that that scheme is going to be introduced in the near future. You know, these things take a long time. At the moment, um, government are uh, consulting with local authorities about what powers would be needed to enforce any such scheme. And, uh, and one of the officers went on a um, a uh, seminar um, two weeks ago. And it's interesting that the government asked those authorities that have got the schemes in place how they felt the enforcement powers um, should, should be developed, whether they should be developed through the current powers that we've got under uh, the Housing Act 2004 or whether there's a, another way. But what they, what the government were actually doing is asking for authorities' uh, experience and understanding uh, of how, the, how we'd operated the system so, so that they can set the best bits of the enforcement side and then put it into their scheme. So again, that's another um, 
good example of where we have an input uh, at a national level, never mind at a local level. Thank you. Councillor Corkman. Yeah, I think the thing as far as government's concerned, Chair, is don't hold your breath. And, um, <laughs> we need others follow for one. But I, I, I don't think that the why the government like the system we've got at the moment is we can do something that is needed, which is unpopular with the landlords. But we get the blame for it and not the government. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're very clever at this, and I don't think they'll want to take the blame for this. Earth, but this is good. It will raise the standard of housing in our borough, and I really do welcome it. So, um, but I'm just cynical of government, this particular government, if you understand me. Now, um, it, uh, I'm surprised that Councillor Bolt hasn't mentioned this, but I'm looking at the 80. Uh, notices of intent and the failure of this number 80. Now I look at 80 times 30,000, which could transform the, jokingly, which could transform the um, the finances of this local authority. But the, the question I really want to ask is, what is the timetable of this? Because in order to make it credible with all the people that are cooperating and doing the right thing, it is important that this, these 80 do the right thing or get done. And um, I, I don't want to hear a story that we haven't got the resources to do it. And I just wondered what plans are in hand and what is the sort of timetable. Mr. Gill? And do you want to? Uh, first of all, um, I'm not sure that 30 is correct. I think it's more like three. Is it? I think that might be a time post. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll clarify that in a few minutes. Before, before you all get too excited. But um, so what we're doing this month is an inspection schedule, which will pick those up. So in other words, those that haven't applied, those that are failing to comply, so forth, they'll all pick up an inspection, inspection schedule. And then they'll, we'll go through those on a risk basis. So we'll pick the ones that haven't applied first, and they'll be done as soon as we possibly can. So the, the priority is deep, and if you're getting the applications in, getting all the information in, making sure people are aware, so communicating with the landlords, with the agents in the area, with owner occupiers, with you know, uh, land, um, sorry, uh, tenants and so forth. So that's been the priority and the real focus. And bearing in mind, I'm going to say it because you knew it would. The team have been down to two people since the beginning of December. So I've pushed them to concentrate on that. And then when we get to March, the plan is to get the inspection schedule sorted and get cracking out there on the inspections. And they've already started, just to reassure you. And those 80 will be the priority first before we get on to the other. Can I, can I just ask, are these 80 already at a penalty stage? At what stage does it penalty, yeah. Penalty come in. Right, the, the 80 have been issued with a notice of intent. Basically, it says that either sort it or then we will look to issue a final notice. So there's a staged process. Um, firstly, you have to issue them with a notice of intent. The number was much greater than the, the 80. I think it was something more about 120 or 130. So the service of the um, notice of intent was sufficient to bring people to the fact that they'd got to license. Um, you go through that process and then um, as John says what's going to happen is they're going to do the inspections at that point if they haven't done it they, they will be issued with the final notice and the initial final notice is 3000 which is quite right however I was right because Ultimately, if you do not license and you end up before the uh, tribunal, the penalty is a civil penalty of up to £30,000 per property. So there, there's a range of penalties. The first one is, is basically <coughs> not registering uh, or not making the application. And then the final one is actually, I suppose, having the building let as a private let with no license. Uh, and, and that penalty can be up to £30,000. So can I ask, does the, does the money come to this authority or does it go into some great central the, go, the, all, the money comes into this authority. So all of the fees uh, for the application, all of the fees for the enforcement fees and all of the penalties that are imposed 
come into this authority. And in fact, members approved the penalty scheme, civil penalty scheme, two years, two and a half years ago. So we have a we have a a scheme how we calculate what penalty we would impose. Um, but the 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 recipient of that penalty does have the right to appeal to the first tier tribunal. Uh, am I right in saying that with the selective licence, and if you are renting to a family member, they're not included in this? That's correct, Chair. Yeah. There, there are various exemptions. And in fact, if you look at that section about it, it does talk about exemptions that mm. um, the number of properties that we have exemptions on. Two. Uh, yeah, two. <laughs> so there's two properties where, there, where there, there's a family relationship and therefore it's not a commercial um, rent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Carson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Mr Gill uh, made a preemptive strike there. I was going to ask about air quality monitoring. Um, I'm pleased to hear that other proactive measures have been taken, as he outlined in terms of Section 106, to uh, get air monitoring um, stations elsewhere in the borough. Um, my understanding was we were also trying to establish air quality, active air quality monitoring systems within our ten centres. Um, perhaps he would like to comment on that. Well, what I can say is in a future meeting we'll bring in a, an action plan back to you, which will give you more clarity on that. This is work I'm now picking up given that the regulatory service manager has left um, and stuff I'm being where, made aware of that now needs pushing that hasn't been. So I'll bring that back to a future meeting to clarify that for you. Thank you much. And the other question I've got relates to item 8.1, top of page 17. Um, it gives figures for the number of dogs we've seen in 2021. Um, do we have any, any indication of figures for 21, 22 to date? I think I'm conscious of that because we hear a lot about dogs that were purchased during the pandemic. Uh, people have gone back to work. So in the back of my mind was a slight alarm bell that that figure could have significantly gone up. Whereas the second line there says this is a reduction on previous years. What is the situation as far as 21, 22 is concerned? I think it's probably trebled. I'm not, I can't give you an exact figure, Councillor Carter, but I think at the end of the day, you're quite right, the pandemic has had an impact, and that's cost the whole of the county. So I met with a contractor about a month or so ago, we were talking to him about the impact of this and, and obviously future operations and how we can expand the contract and so forth. And he made it quite clear to us a massive increase in strays across the county. So we're not alone in it. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's forced on us by what's happened. Okay, thank you, Matt. That's extremely sad to hear that uh, dogs are being thrown out because they're no longer used to their owner. Uh, Councillor Bolter, please. Thank you. I think you're going to read my mind a bit, isn't it? However, <laughs> which is most concerning. <laughs> the dog patrols, I can't understand why they were stopped for most of last year. I don't have COVID, but on foot, walking in the streets. So I can't understand why the dog patrols have actually stopped. Also, my experience, matter dog mess is increasing within the borough. Um, you know, so I expect to see some smashing from the uh, dog wardens regarding that by the next reporting time. Um, now, come to a more interesting bit. I must be getting a bit sick in my old age no. because I went through the um, council minutes again just to refresh my memory. And getting older, my memory is perhaps a little lacking to what it was. <laughs> but then I read it back to the budget papers. And on the budget papers, it said that the enforcement for selective licensing, now at this point, make it clear. And that would declare an interest because I've already done that in the past, and this is a general thing about licensing, so that's not the way. We were told the original budget was £550,000. Then we were told, ah, that's the wrong figure. 
It's still an extra 2,000 pounds less than that. Right, now today's paper, we've got 516,000 pounds. So for one budget paper, when we set the budget just three weeks ago, three weeks ago, we've increased 234,000 pounds. Now somebody somewhere must be wrong. Are they wrong no, budget no. papers? But we're given the wrong figure. No. Sorry, no, it's not wrong, Councillor uh, Bolter. The position is that in the year, the first year, 2021, it was two hundred thirty-four thousand pounds increase. In the second year, uh, it was two hundred eighty-two thousand, which makes five hundred sixteen thousand. The five hundred fifty thousand pounds that was in the budget papers, as I explained previously, was an error. The scheme was never ever. Going to make more than 800 to 850,000 pounds. That was going to be front loaded because of the way the applications go. A decision was then taken that rather than putting the money over a number of years, it would be brought forward to the first year um, to assist the, the uh, revenue flow, which was fine. So it went in the budget as 550,000. And then unfortunately, that got carried forward to the next year. As another 550,000, and then the next year, another 550,000. So, when you looked at the budget papers, it looked like the scheme was going to generate 1.65 million over three years. The reality was it was never going to do more than 800, 850,000 over five years. But the figure that, that, that was in the budget paper, the 282, that's what was collected this year. The rest of it was collected in the year before when the scheme first started. If that uh, clarifies that. It wasn't very clear on budget papers, was it, about that? This is another committee, I assume. With great respect, Professor Mulder, I'm not an accountant and, and I don't have anything to do with budget papers, um, but I can give you the explanation as I've uh, just had them. Yes, well, it doesn't. Uh, can you use your microphone? When you read the budget papers, we, we pass the budget on. It doesn't make that clear. <laughs> One trying to make. But also, uh, we're still not going to make the money we thought we are going to make, are we? Because it was 550, it's 516. So, can you explain that one to us? The 516,000 is actually what is in the bank. The, the 80 properties... Where did the fixed come from then? Sorry, the, well, if you look at the uh, 80 properties that are outstanding, if the 3,000 pound each, they're not registering, well, there's 240,000 pounds. We're not going to get all of that but there are going to be a number of those properties where we are going to receive that money. Uh, and even if you just take it as everybody pays when they get the notice of intent, there's 80 properties, it's just under £900. I'm not going to do the math, but that's £80,000 or thereabouts. Add that to the 516, there's your 550. We should watch for the interest next project papers then, won't we? <laughs> Councillor Lloyd, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just as an aside, uh, this council has a long history of coming up with initiatives, good initiatives, which are then taken on by other districts and councils. Um, unfortunately, we don't get the recognition for it, and we lose good officers because of it, because they're then poached by... Um, other areas. Um, but coming back to this selective license, um, it's a shame that we are having to go down this line because we do have many very good landlords in the borough. Unfortunately, we also have some not so good and some probably downright awful. Uh, landlords and Leicester City are finding that now to their cost, which is why they're taking on these initiatives. It's not about the money, and we've spent a lot of time this evening talking about money that's being brought in. The reason we looked at going down this line was to protect the tenants, and I think we have to keep that as our priority. It's the people at that are living in these properties, which need to be protected from some 
not so good landlords. And we have a duty to make sure that they are being protected, that their lives are of a sufficient standard and that they are not being used and abused by unsafe <clears throat> landlords. And I think that, that has always got to be our priority and not so much talking about money. I know it's important, but priority number one is the tenant and their standard of living in rented accommodation. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lloydell, and very well said. Uh, there are no more speakers, and the contents of this report is about to be noted. We move on to item 10. Uh, Mr. Wells, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. So the gambling policy, we have a duty to provide a policy and update it every three years. Main reason is to prevent gambling from being a source of crime, ensuring that gambling is conducted in a fair and open way and protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited. The draft policy, which is provided at Appendix A, sets out a framework for applicants to follow and it tells them how we will process applications when we receive them. We're required to consult on this, and that process has already started until the 28th of March, with the final draft of the policy being considered by Council at its meeting on the 5th of April. The committee tonight are requested to approve the revised version, subject of course to any consultation responses might receive. Given little has changed with legislation, the policy remains fundamentally the same, there are just some updates on local information and the profile of businesses within the borough. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Charles, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, having read the paper thoroughly, I need to declare an interest again. I'm an employee of Leicester Racecourse, so I will not take part or vote on this matter. Thank you. Councillor Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mine is probably a bit too what's the anti question for process. Um, reading the report and the recommendation, it is clear as uh, the officer stated that that is very different the way major very different the way of major reviews of this legislation is reviewed on this. But because there's been very few checks, very little in very little changes in, in, in legislation or Consequently, the, the uh, policy is fundamentally sound. I can see that it's expedient that uh, we, we set the recommendations before them. Um, when reading the leading statement, it states following public consultation, any amendments to the policy are required to be considered at this committee and then approved by the full council. Now, I'm reading that. As though that is a requirement for section 349 of the Gambling Act 2005. Am I there? Can I therefore be assured that by following the recommendations, we are not taking breach of that piece of legislation? Thank you, um, Councillor Carter. The simple fact of the matter is the state of gambling policy is a matter for council. So um, at this here, it could normally comes to licensing and regulatory for you to take a view and then it goes to consultation. But ultimately, even if it did come back, you couldn't make the decision, you would have to refer it to council. So because of the timing of this, literally it's just missing out that second step of you consulting uh, or considering the um, representations. And it's considered to be very low risk on the basis that on the last occasion the gambling policy was approved, we didn't have any uh, representations or consultation uh, responses uh, and the, the safety net if, if members are, were concerned about not seeing it is that the delegation is uh, to myself um, in consultation with the chair um, and, and I say it's extremely unlikely we're going to get any uh, responses that, that would need any amendments. Yeah, thank you very much, I fully understand. It's just the way I read that, it seems to imply the legislation required it to go through a, a three-stage process in order. The other question, um, which I think is a fair question to ask, is um, with reference to 2.5, um, that states 
the draft will need to be taken to council for approval. You must approve, it must be published for four weeks prior to coming into force. There is that the same is coming into effect because the actual policy, uh, section 14.0, talks about it coming into immediate effect on the 5th of April. So just seems to be an inconsistency if I read it. The statement of licensing policy will come into effect on the 5th of April and will be valid for three years. So there's a bit of an inconsistency between the report and the actual draft policy. Well spotted, Councillor Carter. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that will be amended. Thank you for your consultation response, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Lloyd. Uh, yes, Chairman, I, I've got no problems with this report um, whatsoever, but I'm, I'm on a bit of a, um, a, a hobby horse at the moment um, because I've read through this report and, as I say, I've got no problems with it. However, um, and I hope the rest of the, the group will agree with me, I do have serious concerns about gambling and the different methods of gambling which we are now seeing increasingly through advertising on social media and TV. Whether anybody else has noticed, but you cannot put the television on to any channel at the moment without seeing advertising coming up about people or encouraging people to gamble while having tea parties, all sorts of different things to encourage you to get your money out and go online and start gambling. And up in the top right hand corner or the bottom in small print, it will say gamble sensibly. Um, and I just wonder whether we as a council could use our initiative once again and to send representation to the Gambling Commission expressing concerns about the increase amount of social and TV advertising for gambling because if you look on page 35 of this report 35 big 50 little in the paragraph it says protecting children and vulnerable people from gambling it says there in seeking to protect vulnerable people who gamble more than they want to people who gamble beyond their means and people who not, may not be able to make informed or balanced decisions about gambling, perhaps due to mental impairment, alcohol or drugs. We do have vulnerable people around and these adverts are so persuasive to encourage. And I know it doesn't make part of this licensing objective here, mm. but as a group, I think we probably ought to be taking another step and asking the Gambling Commission to take a look at the online and social media gambling to try and protect more vulnerable people. Um, and I know that's probably, if this group will allow it, going to give Mr Gill some more work, but I know he loves it. Um, but it is to express our serious concerns about that. Um, with your permission, Chair, if the group would look at that and either say yay or nay. Okay, we'll uh, speak about it after the we've had all the um, the people who want to ask questions. Councillor Corfman. I'm full of admiration for Councillor Carter, as he deserves a gold star or whatever. <laughs> I was going to ask something um, rather different than that because I don't have the ability of um, that council card to have to spot these things. And what I'm going to ask in future, when we have these uh, that various statements, policy statements, where they're almost the same, except for minor changes, is it possible to identify the changes so that lady people like me can read what I want to read rather than what is down there? 
can easily identify the changes in something like this. Uh, I'm sure when it's being typed up, somewhere along the list there's in a different color, the alterations. And I wonder if that's the way, because uh, there are a couple of other of these things coming to members. And I wondered if it could be presented to members in that way. That's what you we can certainly do that. I'd be reluctant to do it in terms of track changes because track changes get very confusing. Um, we could put the amendments in a different colour, um, but then would members want a copy of the previous policy? Because uh, I'm, I'm trying to work out how you would know what's changed. If I just put something in, in red, well that's, well, that's fine, but, but what, what did it say before? So, you know, whether you wanted a copy of the old policy as it stands and then a copy of the new policy with the changes highlighted in a different colour or underlined or done in italics or something. Um, to, to I'll, leave, the different... I'll leave it to you, Chair. I'll, I'll leave it to the officers, but some ways that we can easily identify. If we want to look back at the old policy, once our attention has been drawn to it, we can. And while I've got the floor, I'm noticing that despite the efforts by officers here, I think everybody has got a paper copy of this agenda. It's obviously proving to me that I'm not the only one that struggles with it on a computer. Perhaps we've learned something by that. <laughs> Perhaps we've learned that we should replace iPads with laptops with bigger screens that might make it easier. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Councillor Bolter. Thank you, Chair. I think I'll make a small comment. On page um, 35 at the bottom of the page, or 15 at the side of the page, also one that's confusing these different page numbers. Types of license, you know. Right, this is quite clear. There are no current no casinos operating in the borough. Fine. It says here, we can pass a no casino resolution on 166 of the gambling act. Um, should we consider doing that? In view of the population we've got in the borough, I think it might be prudent to actually go down that route and um, pursue a no casino policy for the borough. It's not compulsory to go to a casino, is it? <laughs> it, it, it just make part, and the fact is, we don't have any um, casinos in the borough. The Gambling Act was passed in 2005. <clears throat> There's never been any application or attempt to open a casino in the borough. Does that mean that that I, I don't have a crystal ball? What's the chances, you know, in in what 17 years there's never been an application um if an application came in you would deal with it in the appropriate way and it, you could refuse it you know if it came um it's, an, it's entirely a matter for members but uh, i think that there's lots of other things that we're doing that that you know are more pressing than, than one of those but if members chose to do that then that's down to members that's fine but what grounds could you refuse it on if you've got no policy and it fits in the license, poli license policy, you can't refuse it. So if you pass this act, it can't come anyway. But it, it, it's very similar to the license act 2003. You've got your license objectives. If your licensing objectives are not met, that would give you a ground for refusing any application. Just like if, if you had a, an application for a licensing, uh, for a premises license, um, and it came in and it didn't, it didn't comply with the license and objectives, then you could refuse it, despite the fact that you might have a policy, might not have a policy that deals with that specific thing. Um, so, so it's not. It doesn't mean to say because you because you've not got a no casino policy it doesn't mean to say that somebody could walk in and you have no option but to grant it to them. I think that's that's the way I'm trying to put it. I think at the moment, uh, Councillor Bolter, the a lot of other things that are more pressing. Uh, Councillor Lloyd. Uh, yes, Chair. I mean, in the light of what I've just said, my mm, people will probably think I would agree with Councillor Bolter and say no. 
However, um, I think once you say no, you'll get somebody come along and say, ah, oh, but I was just about to apply for one and I'm going to challenge it. And then we're going to have to start defending the case. Surely it's much better to have conditions imposed or have conditions sorted out ready in case one comes along rather than saying no and then having to defend a challenge which will come because people are like that um i i don't think saying no and then having to fight it later on i could see somebody wanting to take it to the high court and the European Court of whatever, if we're still able to do that these days, I don't know. So I'm, I'm not happy with going down the line of saying a blanket no. Councillor Bolter, I'll let you come back providing you quick. There's no right of appeal. We pass this policy, there's no right of appeal. What is this paperwork? If you pass the, the, the policy, the policy itself is always susceptible to judicial review. Always. So what is it saying here? There's no right to appeal. Where are you looking at, uh, Councillor? Uh... Page 36. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Oh, page 36. I'm just finding it. Right. Sure I can just, if I can make it. Um, just that one thing was actually, if, if a decision is made that there's no casino, there's got to be and in information of why that decision has been made. And I suppose the thing is, provided a robust argument under that proposal that we made a resolution, then there would be no appeal. If we just made willy nilly without any regard for the circumstance and reasons, then clearly there would be, from my view. Right. All right. Um, Councillor Bolter, I'll let you come back to provide your point. Uh, does the committee agree? with asking Mr Gill to uh, write to the Gambling Commission. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And those against? Abstention? There is an abstention and Michael's not involved. No, no, no. Okay. okay. Right, we'll move on to the vote that the draft statement of the gambling policy 2022 to 2025 be approved and its adoption recommended to full council subject to any amendment arising from the consultation pro uh, process and that delegated authority be granted to the head of law and democracy to consider any other amendments that may be necessary in consultation with the chair of license and regulatory committees. All those in favour? Anybody against? Abstentions, no. Okay, thank you. We move on to... Uh, no, that's it. That's it. That's that's it. it. We have now completed it, so thank you very much for your attendance and uh, good night. Thank you.